Today we're going to be exploring the collective efforts to preserve those elements of culture that for a variety of reasons have been deemed essential to our heritage. Um, buildings and landscapes that reveal the values of our time and express the character of the places that we cherish, places like the Presidio. We're also here, I think, to challenge ourselves, put away our preconceptions and challenge ourselves to rethink how culture relates to the natural world, a relationship that has changed over time and, and has now really become so challenged that it threatens the existence of both. So we have to get it together and we have to get it right. And it's a good time to sit down and talk about it. It's likely, I imagine, that you're here because you already recognize that there's a divide between culture and nature. After all, this division has been with us since the Enlightenment. Uh, it hasn't gone away. And uh, it has huge political impacts. It has huge uh, planetary impacts. It's an important thing for us to be discussing. So I'm honored to welcome you here to the Presidio for this conversation because it's not only important generally, but it's really fundamental to what we do at the Presidio. Um, and I hope that our conversations here will help others bridge this nature cultural gap. So I, I thought I'd start uh, just to get us going by conjuring up just a bit of the history of the Presidio, get a sense of the cultural landscape that we have here and what we're doing here. Because it really is a dynamic relationship between nature and culture that's being played out here and has in fact been playing out here for well over two centuries. In 1776, as America was declaring its independence back east, history was happening out here and the development of the American West was beginning to occur out here. The Spanish came in 1776. They established a fort. A few months later, they established Mission Dolores. And these were really the only two points on the map. And this is the beginning of the colonization of the West, uh, the beginning of the destruction of the indigenous peoples of this area, the rapid transformation that began, became more and more rapid as the as centuries came along, and particularly in the 20th century, the transformation of land, of the environment, um, of the popular culture. The US Army arrived in 1846. And uh, given this unbelievably central and strategic position on the west coast at the, at the mouth of this great bay, um, the Presidio became the most important military post in the country on, on the west coast, in, in west of the Mississippi. And, uh, and interestingly, even though uh, during the 20th century, that strategic importance began to wane, very important in the early part of the 20th century. Toward the end of the 20th century, it began to wane. It was still very symbolically important. After all, where would you like to be stationed? This was the best billet in the US Army. And uh, if you go and uh, look at some of the uh, houses around here and you notice how many of them are built for high-ranking officers, you can understand that many people spent their last couple of years here before leaving the service. Interestingly. Uh, the Presidio was the command for about 13 different military posts that were ringing the bay. And what that ultimately did for us, in addition to uh, providing for national security, it also secured the land. It secured the landscape and eventually enabled those bases to become part of one of the great national parks in an urban area. Amy, I apologize. Uh, but one of the great park parks in, in the United States and even in the world. So here we already see some interesting juxtaposition between nature, culture, how it all starts to come together. The Army really cared about the Presidio. They thought it was beautiful and they wanted to make it more beautiful. Although it, they also, I think, considered it somewhat of a blank slate, a blank canvas on which they could, you know, make their place uh, a memorable place. and. Um, so what did they do? They took the land and they planted trees. They, they planted a forest where a forest hadn't been before. 
they built beautiful curved boulevards. They built homes along those boulevards. They really took a lot of inspiration, and Michael Boland, my colleague, will talk more about this later, but took inspiration from what was going on in urban parks throughout uh, the country. This was not something that necessarily grew from the land here. It was something that was imported. It was, these were ideas that were somewhat exotic to the place, brought to the place, and, and, and manifest in the landscape that we see today. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit and say, you know, we talk about emblematic American culture. We talk about American places, what makes a place American. Well, one of the things you know, that makes this place so American is that it really is part of that American tradition of creating natural places and preserving places as national parks. So in the early 70s, as these lands were begun, beginning to be envisioned as, as places for uh, the public and places that would no longer be needed for military uses. They became a part of this national park called the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. The Presidio was included in that imagining, even though I don't think anybody at that time thought it would actually close. But in 1972, there was a line that said, should the Presidio ever become access to the needs of the military, it would become part of this national park, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. 25 years later, it, it starts to happen. And um, at that time, you know, we were in a time that actually in some ways wasn't that dissimilar from the, con the political times that we were in now. You know, we had a lot of fiscal austerity be being talked about. Newt Gingrich had just taken over as Speaker of the House after somewhat something like 40 years of democratic rule of the House. Uh, things were changing, and there was a lot of talk about the price of things, the price of government. And so ultimately, we cut a deal. And the deal was um, had a, a dual mandate, that we would preserve the cultural landscape. We would preserve and restore and conserve the natural habitats of this place. And we would do so in a way that ultimately would wean the costs off of the backs of the national of the American taxpayer. Fifteen years to do that, and you know the kicker was if you didn't do it, they would sell the place. It was a heavy charge, this in 1996, and for the past two decades, we and Myriad Partners, National Park Service, so many volunteers, organizations like this, have come together to try to knit um, together in this very fascinating way, culture and nature here in this particular place, a small place, a grand experiment in a small place, two and a half acres, although with high visibility at the Golden Gate. Um, so we've taken the buildings, there's 847 at last count buildings. Uh, as Diane Feinstein says, they continue to get more historic so it used to be there were 450 historic buildings. I think we're getting close to 500. And, well, I, I won't say what that means for me, but, um, you know, I guess we're all getting older. Um, take the buildings, take some of these cultural landscape elements that were used for the military, the military grand parade grounds. Take even the concept of community that was so essential to the military culture here. Uh, and is now essential to the park culture here. And weave these things together, the remnants that, that existed, that the Army almost inadvertently preserved of the natural landscape and the habitat, and weave them together in this sort of blend that I don't know that had, has ever been done before. Um, so it really has been fascinating. Today, um, through this work, um, we've really been able to rehabilitate over 350 historic buildings, um, myriad national uh, cultural landscapes. The forest is now on a, a sustainable course. The forest that was planted in the 1890s now, uh, now uh, all falling apart, really dying, um, is now on a sustainable course. Um, turning around the decline of the natural systems, restoring riparian habitats and urban watersheds, um, bringing back bird populations, and building a community of about 7, 7,500 people who live and work here. Uh, and 
in all of that also creating uh, an economic engine that's dynamic and is able to sustain all of the work now and into the future. So it's been this interesting experiment, this interesting blend of things coming together. And in doing all of that, I think one of the challenges has been actually to challenge the traditional thinking around what is a national park? How does the public sector work with the private sector? What is the role of private investment in public lands? Um, how do we get along together? If, how do, well, I'm not going to go where, where Frank Dean only dares to go, which is the discussion about how do dogs and people get along. That seems to be one of the hardest things to work out. Uh, but seriously, how do natural habitat and people get along, and how do you live together, and how do you work together, and make it all work. And so, as we and you sit around today and think about all of the issues related to this blending of culture and nature to the benefit of both, I hope you will take a little bit of time um, and walk around the Presidio and be inspired as I am, and I know many people who are in this room are, by the views, by the mix, by the beauty, uh, and by the whole idea of what we're trying to do here. And I hope that can help. But um, I really uh, want to close by uh, saying welcome and also uh, saying on behalf of my friend uh, Frank Dean, who's not able to be here today, he's the superintendent of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, a wonderful guy. Uh, and uh, I know he would like to be here to welcome you as well, but on behalf of both of us and all of us in this community, welcome to the Presidio, and, and I uh, look forward to the conversations ahead.